Hello Soundies, welcome to our Sound for Video session. Today is the 5th of December, 2021. It's good to have you here. I uh, hope everyone's doing well out there. It's been um, unseasonably dry here. Uh, <laughs> hope maybe some of you are getting a little bit more moisture, a healthy amount of moisture. Uh, in any case, let's jump on over to our agenda and we'll take a look at what we've got going for today. First up, we're going to talk about microphone polar patterns and using that as you're making a choice as to which microphone to use. And in fact, we had one question submitted ahead of time and that one question is actually related. So I'm gonna jump into that question right away because I think it will help inform our discussion on polar patterns here. So this question is from John and John says, I use the Sony UTX M03 radio handheld microphone. I find radio makes the system excellent, but the microphone has to be quite close to the mouth in order to get good pickup. Could you recommend any other type of capsule that I could change on the M03 or M03, I'm not sure what it is, to increase the distance from the mouth to the microphone as far down as the belly button? I have seen in some ENG type news situations where handheld microphones are held very far away, but sound is excellent and they are not boom microphones. Question mark. So ENG, of course, standing for electronic news gathering, just another way to say news. So um, that is a fine, fine question. So we're going to keep that in the back of our minds here as we talk about polar patterns a little bit. And to jump into that conversation, let me just show you um, a couple of things here. I want to... I have a whole bunch of things open on the Mac here, and I want to get to the right one. So we're going to go to Preview, and we have... Oh, boy. A whole bunch of polar patterns so here we go i'll get switched over to that all right let me just walk through a couple of different polar patterns that you've probably heard of and talk about some nuances that we we really haven't covered here before um, first up we have this is a, what is often referred to as a shotgun polar pattern or a low bar i've heard it called as well um, a lot of times shotgun microphones can also be described as super cardioid which looks a little bit more like this um, but let me just describe what each of these mean. Here's a cardioid polar pattern. So the graph here, zero degrees represents the front of the microphone that is directly into the capsule. And then 180 degrees down here at the bottom, in this particular case, refers to the back of the microphone. So in many cases, that's going to be where the XLR output is located, um, or it's basically just 180 degrees opposite the front of the microphone, the grill that you are supposed to talk into or capture the sound source through. And then often we have 90 degrees and 270 degrees off to this, uh, the sides at 90 from zero. Now it's important to keep in mind that this graph also should be thought of in three-dimensional terms. So it's represented in two-dimensional terms, but it's actually three-dimensional when we're talking about polar patterns. So for example, a cardioid polar pattern here, um, if you move off to the side at 90 degrees, it starts to fall off some. You can hear it. it becomes less sensitive. The microphone picks up a little bit less sound. Specifically, if you look at the lines here, each of these represent a minus 5 dB fall off. So in the case of this microphone, this is um, at 90 degrees off axis. It falls off by about probably 6, maybe 7 dB. And then once you get to the back of the microphone, if you're perfectly at the back, it basically picks up nothing. If you're off uh, just a little bit here, it's actually minus 20 dB relative to the front of the microphone and so on and so forth. But this also represents uh, three dimensions. So if I were to somehow levitate up above my microphone, 90 degrees, the same thing would apply here. So I would get a six or seven dB drop off up there as well. And that also applies to any of these others. Okay, so it's important to think of these in three-dimensional terms. That's the first thing. There are some nuances here as well. And I think what often gets lost is that we, we often think that a, for example, a this is right here, a super cardioid polar pattern. And watch the difference here. I'm going to move over to a hypercardioid. Very subtle difference. And not only is it a subtle difference, but I think there's a range uh, for describing each of these. So if you're talking if you're talking about a hypercardioid, it could be more extreme than this. It could have a long uh, you know a larger sensitivity tail here in the back uh, in some cases. And you can see the difference here if you look very closely. Here's again supercardioid. If we move to hypercardioid, the front gets a little bit more 
a little bit more focused, a little bit more narrow. And that is to say, especially here at the sides, at 270 degrees and 90 degrees, watch what happens when I switch back to super cardioid. Picks up a little bit more. So the attenuation is about 10 dB here on super cardioid. And on hypercardioid, it falls to more like, hmm, not a lot, but probably minus 13 dB or something in that range. So there can be some subtle differences here in the differences between a hypercardioid, supercardioid, um, and cardioid. So cardioid typically does not have a rear tail, a rear lobe, as they say. And then, of course, a shotgun microphone has a fairly substantial rear lobe here. You can see in this case, and again, this is just a sample. Some of them may have a larger tail. Some may have a smaller tail. Just depends. Um, so here in this case, for example, at the tail or the back of the microphone, it's attenuating by about 10 dB, which is substantial, but um, you know it's not super, super isolating necessarily either. So it's just important to keep that in mind. So there are a lot of nuances here. What's more, um, let me just see, is there another one I can pull up here? Let me just, this little preview app is a little bit funny. Um, yeah, let's, let's, let's go there. What I wanna do next is talk about the particular microphone that John was asking about. So let me switch back on over here. And he is referring specifically to the Sony UTX M03 handheld wireless microphone. And this, I assume his, uh, John, yours came with a cardioid capsule. So that's going to be, again, something that looks a bit more like this. So it's gonna be sensitive in the front. It's not gonna be very sensitive. It's, it's gonna to start to fall off at the sides and then it's gonna be least sensitive at the back. In addition to that, this microphone, I believe, is a dynamic microphone. Um, they don't say, do they say, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. more details. Uh, I'm, going to re I'm going to assume that this is a dynamic microphone. Pretty sure it is. Um, you can choose other capsules as well to put on it. What I would say is this, let me, let me just show you a little something here. Let me show you my overhead. So here we have a shotgun microphone, but let me come back to that a little bit later. Uh, what I want to show first here is a an interview microphone. So this is the Rode. Well, I don't. What do they call this? Oh, they call this the Rode Reporter. So it has a long handle. That's one. That's one feature you'll often see fairly long handle so you can have a little bit more reach if you're interviewing somebody. Um, but what's different about this microphone is that it actually has an omnidirectional polar pattern. So this is actually going to pick up sound from all directions all around it. Now you might ask to your, you know, yourself, why would you ever want to do that for an interview microphone? Oftentimes you're doing interviews in noisy spaces and that's true. But the nice, the nice thing about having an omnidirectional dynamic microphone in those cases is that um, aiming the microphone, you're not, it's not so critical to aim the microphone perfectly. And instead, to isolate the sound that you're trying to capture from the noise you're trying not to capture, this relies on the sensitivity of the dynamic microphone instead. So this is a case where you can hold it not quite so close or not aim it perfectly. You can hold it basically between you and the person you're interviewing, and you'll get some pretty good results. Now, I want to be very careful here, John. I think it's important to know that you are you know it's not going to the nice thing about the microphone you have right now is that it is it's more directional so it's going to be better at isolating the sound that you want from the sound that you don't want so that's the first thing um, but you could move to an omnidirectional which will make it less necessary to get the aim just right and you can hold it a little bit farther away from you if you use enough gain um, but it will pick up a little bit more background noise so it's a trade-off and that's kind of the theme i wanted to cover here today is that there are definitely trade-offs here. It's almost always a trade-off. And let me do just do a search here. Uh, let's see, I think it was, um, I did an interview at the NAB show a number of years ago, and this would be audio limited. And let's see here. Yeah, here's the interview right here. Um, let me just bring this up. And I wanna, I'm gonna actually, yeah, let's bring it up. I'm a voiceover artist. Oh, here's an ad for voiceover beard. <laughs> I earn a living in my walk-in closet, simply reading scripts for businesses. And, and I was way, able to...
that were acquired by. Um, okay, we'll pause it there. Um, this this episode was not actually brought to you by Voiceover Beard, but if you're in the Voiceover game, looks like some interesting content he's got there. So here I'm using the Rode Reporter microphone. In this case, I was standing fairly close. Um, I was able to to mic him with you know, and I you know because I could, I aimed it at his mouth generally. But as we got farther into the interview. Um, it wasn't always perfectly aimed, and I brought it a little bit closer to me when I was talking, tried to hold it a little bit closer to him when he was talking. So that's an advantage of using an omnidirectional reporter microphone, which is typically a dynamic microphone, just so you're aware. That's another option out there, so if, if there is another capsule like that for your Sony system, that could potentially be an option for you. But listen, if you want to, go ahead and listen to this interview just to get a sense for what kind of isolation it provides. Um, and you can see where I'm holding it. I'm not holding it down by the belly button, so that's one thing. Um, if you are if you are seeing that situation, I think a lot of times in news these days they're using lavalier microphones plus handheld microphones when they're doing interviews, like on the street and things like that. So it could be deceiving because it, it could be that they're picking up sound from a different uh, a few different sound sources. So just keep that in mind as well. It's not. It's not necessarily that they're just using that handheld microphone. So that's an important one to keep in mind. All right, let's switch on back. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm gonna go ahead and I wanna take a look at some other things here. Uh, while we're on the topic of polar patterns, uh, another thing to consider is which types of mics have which types of polar patterns? Here is a lavalier microphone, for example. Let's switch back over to this. This is the Rode Lavalier 2. It's a new lavalier microphone from Rode. And 99% uh, of lavalier microphones have an omnidirectional polar pattern, which means that they pick up sound from all directions. Um, and usually, Sometimes they have a tiny bit of directionality, but it's not something that's terribly noticeable. Um, and that even implies to microphones like this. So this has what some people refer to as a front firing capsule. So it faces the front of the microphone. Nevertheless, it is still a an omnidirectional polar pattern that it, it uses. So that's important to keep in mind. And again, that's going to apply to 99% of lavalier microphones. So keep that in mind um, as well. All right, I want to talk about shotgun microphones again. These are the this is the Rycote HC15, so a 15 centimeter uh, shotgun microphone, and this one they actually cite it as having a hypercardioid polar pattern. So they don't actually call it a low bar or a shotgun. They call it a shotgun microphone with a hypercardioid polar pattern. And let's take a look at what that looks like. So if I pull that up over here on the Mac, um, in fact, you're going to see my messy desktop here for just a minute because this is like just being in the room with me here <laughs> and we're using lower resolution, so things are all overlapped at the moment. Actually, I'm going to go back and we're just going to go to the site and pull it up. So I'm going to go to rycote.com. I'm going to get more information about these shotgun microphones and I'm going to pull up the spec sheet. Okay, make that bigger. There we go. All right, here is the polar pattern for the HC15 short shotgun microphone. What is nice about some of the more professional oriented microphones is they will often provide a more detailed polar graph, a polar response graph, and they what they're revealing here is that they're sh they're showing us that at different frequencies the microphone has different directionality characteristics that is to say this kind of lavender line right here that has the funky shape to it is what happens at 1500 hertz or 15000 hertz excuse me 15 kilohertz in other words so high frequency it gets uh, very directional and it has this really kind of wavy odd sort of line Whereas down here at 2000 hertz, it becomes more like a pear shape almost. And then it becomes much more of what we typically think of as uh, supercardioid or hypercardioid when you're talking about the lower frequencies at um, over here. This is 1000 hertz and 250 hertz, I believe. So it, it is different directionality at different 
um, different frequencies. So that's important to keep in mind as well. And that's especially true. You'll especially find this on shotgun microphones. As soon as the microphones get more directional, it seems that you, you start to encounter more of the differences between the different frequencies. And let me see if I can find another one here. Um, here's the 4017B. This is the DPA microphone that I use, the shotgun microphone that I typically use. And look at this. Um, <laughs> and they actually put, I think, a fair bit of engineering into this one to make it so that it's fairly fairly consistent, but you can see there's still plenty of, of weirdness going on here. Now, the practical application or the practical implication of this is that it actually starts to sound rather odd when you're capturing sounds that are off axis. And let me give you an, a sample of that. I'm going to come over here into Isotope RX. Let's pop that up here. What I did here, this is a shotgun microphone where I was doing, um, I was playing some white sound and I was rotating the microphone so that it was on or off axis to get the different response here. And let me go ahead and play it back a little bit of that to you so you can hear what happens. Now, the thing that I want you to listen for here is that as I turn the microphone away, so obviously right here, I'm on axis. I'm pointing the microphone straight at the speaker that's playing the white noise. This is about 90 degrees off axis here. And this is 180 degrees off axis here. And then I turn it back here. It's off at 270 degrees. And here it's back on at zero degrees. Just so you, see, you know, you know, at least visually what's happening here. But listen what happens to the timbre of the sound. What, what happens to the different frequencies as we play through this? Did you notice anything there? Something very interesting happened. It was like, uh, well, first of all, at, at 90 degrees, we, we, there was actually significantly less pickup than there is at even 180 degrees. So that's an interesting thing. But also the frequencies that you're hearing change as well. Let me play through that again. Hear how when it's off axis, you're hearing more low frequencies and not as many of the high frequencies. And that's exactly what we saw in these different polar graphs here. So here, for example, this blue light blue line is 16 kilohertz. So that's a high frequency. And look, it's attenuating most of that at the back of the microphone. And it attenuates quite a bit of it at the sides as well. It falls off pretty quickly. So if you get off from zero degrees, a lot of that high frequency pickup falls off very quickly. And this actually also speaks to for those that are manually booming uh, or operating a boom pole, um, the, the criticality of getting that microphone aimed correctly um, because you can really change the overall response of the microphone if you don't have it aimed correctly. So there's a little bit of a trade-off there. The more directional you get your microphone uh, or a more directional microphone that you use, the more critical it is to get it aimed appropriately if you really want the full frequency response to be picked up. Now you'll notice here the yellow line is 250 hertz. So when we turned the microphone away, that's what we were mostly hearing was lower frequencies. So it was still kind of that fuzzy sound, but it was definitely in the lower frequencies and that's represented here. So why am I talking about this? Why does anyone care about this? <laughs> I think it's important to understand that when you are working especially with a directional microphone, especially something that's more directional like a shotgun microphone, there are compromises that happen. So if you are trying to capture something that sounds more natural, um, then using a shotgun microphone, anything that's off axis, any noise or sound that's off axis is going to be colored. That is to say, it's going to pick up more of the low frequency of that noise or sound than it is going to pick up the high frequency. So for example, if you're working in um, doing an interview that is near traffic and vehicles are coming by, What's going to happen is that those vehicles are going to sound very different than they would in real life if you're using a shotgun microphone. So you can get more isolation, but those other, you know, those vehicles and that other sound is going to sound less like the real world. So it's important to keep that in mind. If you're doing something where you are doing nature recordings, 
you might want something that sounds a little bit more natural. And so in that case, a shotgun microphone may not be your best choice. So that's the first thing to consider. Now, there are other considerations as well. Um, but, but before we go on, let's go ahead and pause. I think Danny has some um, some questions in the chat there she wants to put up. So let me just come on back to my main camera. Let's take a look at those real quick. Uh, the type of microphone is listed in the specs tab on the BH website. Thank you for that, Daniel. Yeah, that's a good place to look in most cases. Ian Craig, also with the road reporter, much less touchy with regards to wind. Um, interesting. Good point. Thanks for that, Ian. I appreciate that. Curtis could dunk over Shaq. Uh, <laughs> probably not. <laughs> but I appreciate the sentiment. Um, Ken. Broadcast trucks usually come stocked with both Sennheiser MD46 Cardioid and Electro Voice RE50 Omnis. Interesting point. Yeah, I've used I've used both of those, in fact. I, I really like the MD46, but again, it's one of those you do have to have it aimed as you're doing the interview. There's a lot of this going on. With a something like the Electro Voice RE50, which is an omnidirectional dynamic, you don't have to be so aggressive about pointing it back and forth as the two different people are talking. Um, you can just basically hold it between you and... Um, so it's just, there's a different way of working. Uh, Honte, when do you not want to use an omnidirectional lavalier microphone? Whew. Um, um, here's the thing. Cardioid, first of all, a couple things about cardioid lavalier microphones. A, there are not very many of them out there. B, from my experience, I haven't found one that sounds great yet. And number three, they're really hard to position so that they work well because you have to aim them very carefully. So I haven't found them to be a great option for most of the work that I'm working on, but there might be some situations where other people um, have had a better better experience with them. So they tend to be a little bit larger as well. So they're not the type of thing that you can hide under clothing. Um, so those are the things I'd keep in mind there about directional lavaliers. Ooh, new lav from Rode. Is it better than the Tascam DR10L? I don't know. I haven't used it yet. Just unboxed it this morning. So we will have... A review coming up in the next little bit on that particular microphone. Is there such a thing as a hypercardioid mic that doesn't pick up anything behind it? I'm using an Octava MK012, but I can still hear things happening behind it. Well, um, one company that does some very interesting things with microphones and puller patterns is Sankin. <clears throat> I don't remember the exact model number, but they do have a shotgun style microphone that I believe uses two or three capsules in it and it actually uses one of the capsules to detect what's coming in behind the mic and attenuate that signal. So if you're looking for something that really really attenuates or really really focuses what you are picking up and ensures that you're not picking up much from behind that would be something worth looking at. Now I haven't used that in practical situations yet and I don't know what it does overall to the sound in fact maybe we can take a look here let me just go to Sankin's website Sankin microphones and I think it's Sankin chromatic is the URL nope Sankin microphones I'll switch on over to this we're going to capture the action here um, we're going to go to production mics shotgun microphones and let's see here yes it might be the csr2 long reach highly directional mic with switchable rear rejection so the idea is you can turn on this ability to reduce to reduce what you pick up from behind the microphone um which could be really interesting so here's what the polar patterns here's with the rear rejection turned on it's a little bit hard to see that. Let me see if I can zoom in a touch. Whoa, it jumps around a little bit. Okay. Let's get to 2 kilohertz. It's a little bit more super cardioid, but it, it's rejecting quite a bit here. Like if you look at this line, it's around 15 dB. It's doing pretty well on the back there. Um, it does have to be aimed correctly, so you can see at 16 kilohertz you're still getting some of that funniness here and in fact this is odd because it falls off very quickly but then it picks back up again um, I don't know if you can see that so well on the screen here but that's that's one thing that's interesting about these but that is one option out there um, just for that question um, I think it was birds of prey that asked that so birds of prey. 
Birds of Ray, sorry. <laughs> um, let's see. Ooh, right coat shotgun mic. Hey, Curtis, would you still re still recommend the Rode video mic and TG today, or is there a better option out there? <sighs> Depends on what you're doing. Um, it's for on camera microphones. It's it's pretty good. I some of the manufacturers are doing this thing where they're trying to get it to auto detect. They're trying to make it easier to use, but in some re some regards, it it makes it a little bit more difficult to use in some cases. Um, but yeah, it's a pretty good it's a pretty good one for camera top. Can you explain the spec for minimum load on a mic? Um, no. I can't. I, I have to be honest. I don't know what that means, so I'd have to do some research on that, Mark. Sorry about that. Here's another one. Uh, will you explain load impedance spec and how to measure and adjust it? Uh, that one's probably going to take a little bit more time as well, but low, uh, output impedance at least, um, I can say this just at a very practical level. What you watch for when you're looking at the output impedance spec and... and um, I'm sorry, I got distracted by the, the chat there. And maybe I think Alan from SoundSpeeds is here. Alan, if you have more information on this, I would love to have your input on this as well, or anyone else that knows more about this. But for output impedance, um, in the olden days, if we can say that, <laughs> a lot of times what you needed to do was match the output impedance of your microphone with the input impedance of your preamplifier or whatever gear you were going to be sending the microphone signal through. And so just for optimal performance, um, you generally wanted to meet, have those matched. And oftentimes the microphones had a 600 ohm output impedance and the preamplifiers had a 600 ohm input impedance. So they were matched. And so that optimized the overall performance of that gear. In today's world, um, we're gen most gear is generally taking a different approach and that different approach employs something called bridging impedance. And the idea there is that the input impedance is roughly 10 or more times higher than the output impedance of the microphone. So a lot of times, um, you know, most modern microphones have an output impedance of 200 ohms or less generally. And most recording gear, you know, either if you're talking about rack mount or if you're talking about even field recorders on the quality end at least, usually have um, an input impedance of, you know, at least a thousand, but oftentimes much higher than that. So that that fulfills that requirement for bridging impedance, where you have um, the the input impedance is at least ten times what the output impedance of the microphone is. So that's just one thing to keep in mind. So you normally, for example, a lot of the higher quality gear will have an input impedance of at least two thousand ohms. Um, so that will handle pretty much any microphone optimally that has an output impedance of two hundred ohms or less. Hopefully that makes sense. That's the practical implication. Um, a technical description of exactly what it means is, uh, I'm not prepared to talk to that, <laughs> but that's kind of the practical, uh, my understanding of the practical um, implication of output impedance on the specs that you see for microphones and the input impedance specs you see for preamplifiers. Okay, back to the questions. You have some comments. Looks like um, Alan is busy there describing some things. He, yeah. uh, Alan brought up the Senkin CSR2. Very good. Thanks for sharing that, Alan. Uh, uh, Mike also mentioned when using a cabled handheld mic for interviews, one has to be careful when moving it. The cable nearest the mic is highly microphonic, so needs not to be moved and knocked. That's a good point, too. You'll see, um, you may remember from the old, um, <laughs> probably the game show host is probably one you saw a lot, or news reporters back in the day. Oftentimes they would hold on to the cable with one hand and the microphone with the other and try and reduce the amount of movement of the cable because you're right, Mike. Definitely you can pick some of that up as well. Um, Birds of Ray, there, uh, this is again from uh, Alan. There are also microphones like the Digital Shep Super C... Super... There's a Super C-M-I-T. Yeah, it's a Super C-MIT. Sorry, it looks like a typo there. Um Additional microphones built in, built in that they can use to digitally cancel out off-axis sounds in real time. So yeah, the Super Cmit 2U is one. Um, there are also there's outboard gear uh, like the Cedar DNS, which does some denoising. Um, it's also now available as a plug-in for some of the Sound Devices 8 series recorders. So there's some other options there. Uh, the trade-off with the cardioid mic is 
less reach than a supercardioid. This means that unless you are closer, your signal to noise may be lower and sound behind the mic louder. Exactly. These are all trade-offs. And so there's like, I, I get on YouTube, this happens quite often. People will come to a microphone review and say, what's the best mic out there? And it's like, well, there's no best microphone. Um, these are all engineering trade-offs and all performance trade-offs. And so you just have to choose what's best for the particular situation and what fits your particular workflow. So they're all considerations. It's not, it's, what I'm trying to do is teach you some of the nuances here to, to really drive home this idea that understanding these nuances, you can make better informed decisions about which microphone may be better for the particular situation that you're in. And again, to, I guess, also drive home this idea that there is no such thing as a perfect microphone for every situation. I think that's all to okay. that. Well, Alan, there's there's lots of great comments, so make sure to read the chat. Yeah, make sure to read the chat. There's lots going on. Thank you so much, Alan, for the input there. Alan's got Alan is a wealth of information. So thank you for sh sharing Alan, and, which he's showing his sound speeds here. And of course, if you are not aware of his channel, lots of great information to learn there from a great personality in the production sound world. Okay, I wanted to talk about some other things here. Do we have any others we wanted to put up right away? Not, not right now. Not right now. We'll okay. Come back to them. We are Don't going worry. to come back. Um, I wanted to look at some others here. Let's look at, for example, let's look at the Shure SM7B. In fact, that is under here. It's going to be under here, and I think there it is. Okay, so now <laughs> here's, a, here's a little lesson as well. Sure, inverted their polar graph, so they just turned it upside down. So the bottom is the front of the microphone and the top is the back of the microphone. And here's a Shure SM7B. There's some funny stuff going on over here in the frequency response, but as far as the polar pattern, which is interesting here, um, we have, they've actually split it out into two graphs. So the higher frequencies are over here on the right, the lower frequencies on the left. You can see the lower frequencies stay pretty consistent here up to one kilohertz. So nothing really changes there. It's when you start to get above that. So 2,500 hertz, um, we start to see it. It doesn't change a whole lot. That's even still pretty similar to that. But when you get up to 6,300 hertz, that's where it starts to change, where it's more directional on the front, and starts to fall off at the sides more quickly and especially at the back. So, and they don't go up beyond that, beyond 6,300 hertz on their particular polar graph here. But nevertheless, it was, I, I, I always appreciate when manufacturers do stuff like this because you have a better idea without even hearing the microphone what to expect when you do start talking through it or sending sound through it. So that's the SM7B. What I've generally find, it seems like cardioids generally, um, to my experience and to my ear, oftentimes don't experience the craziness that you see with shotgun microphones. Um, again, something like this, where things just start to get really different between the different frequencies. And when you're working on uh, a cardioid, they don't have the reach uh, per, you know, Alan's point, which is true. Um, but what they do make up for is they do tend to sound a little bit more natural to off-axis sounds. So again, depending on what you're recording. That's why I think a lot of times with recordings uh, for, of music, a lot of times they're going to use a cardioid microphone as opposed to a, a super or hyper or shotgun. And in addition to that, um, another characteristic that's important to understand is if you consider... Um, let's come back over here. Coming over here... Here's our polar patterns again. Um, what I haven't represented here is an omnidirectional. So an omnidirectional, basically the line, the dark line would follow the entire circle for the most part. Um, one of the advantages of an omnidirectional microphone, and while it does not do any sort of rejection uh, in terms of uh, using a polar pattern to do rejection, one of the benefits is that it tends not to have a proximity effect. And the proximity effect, of course, is when you move up really close on the microphone, it gets very, very, very bassy. And um, so that's one of the benefits too of using an omnidirectional microphone, like a lavalier. That's why I think that's in part why a lot of lavalier microphones are generally omnidirectional is because if you place them on the chest, they would just get this really overwhelming boomy sound to them. Um, they already do to some extent because of proximity to the chest, but even more so if they were to use a directional polar pattern. Um, so. That's one thing to keep in mind too. So for those recording music, sometimes if you have a controlled acoustic space, 
an omnidirectional can potentially be a better choice. Um, so there's another thought there. All right, what else do we have here to show you? Oh, I want to go back to, I'm going to pop on back over to the Mac here, and I want to show you something very interesting. So we were listening to this earlier on. Let me actually show you the spectrogram view of this. So this is fascinating here. If you see that, this portion right here, actually, let me highlight both channels. That is when we're on axis. This part over here is when we're turning off axis to 90 degrees. And look at this weird filtering that's going on here. This is, again, this is with the shotgun microphone. This is with the HC22, the Rycoat shotgun mic. Um, here's 180 degrees off axis. So there's, again, there is some filtering going on there too. You notice that, the pattern? And let's just listen to it again really quickly. So it's just important to keep in mind that when you're talking about uh, more directional microphones, that um, you are affecting the, the overall timbre of the sound. So it's again, it's one of those situations where there are trade-offs. There's no such thing as a perfect microphone. Um, and I think it's going to, it's going to take um, some substantially different ways of approaching microphone design before we start to see some of that go away. It's going to have to be something that probably includes digital processing at some point if we want something that's going to sound a little bit more natural. So I can foresee in the future, and we've had this question come up a few times, you know, what do you see as a future in production sound and as far as gear is concerned? I think perhaps more things like the Sankins where they're doing some real-time processing of the audio to kind of sculpt the overall sound. So if you want something that's directional, but at the same time doesn't have this really weird kind of stuff going on as far as the, you know, employing a, a low bar or a shotgun or a, you know, extremely directional polar pattern, um, it's going to be things like that that they're going to have to do. And there's still going to be challenges with that as well. Um, but that that's just some, something I wanted to cover here a little bit because I think it's something that a lot of us don't realize when we first start working with these types of microphones is that there are definitely some things. In fact, um, Jeff Wexler, um, a production sound mixer, I believe he's retired now, but he he actually moved away from using shotgun microphones to a large extent. Not entire. Well, I don't know if he entirely stopped using them, but his favorite microphone was the Sheps Colette um, 6 preamp with the MK41, the, the super cardioid polar pattern. And his reasoning for moving to that in many cases was that because he wanted a more natural sound. He wanted something that, that didn't sound quite so otherworldly. Like, for example, if there was a scene that he was shooting out on the street, someone's on the sidewalk, they're talking, traffic's going by. Um, he didn't want something that sounded like as cars went by. So <laughs> um, so he switched to those type of microphones. So just something to keep in mind as you consider what type of microphone to use for different scenarios. All right, let's go back to the chat and see what we've got going over there. So Danny's going to comb There's through for us. The There's a lot going in the chat. So is good. That is good. Glad to hear it. Glad to hear that... Um, this topic is bringing up plenty of conversation. How much gain do you usually set on your mix pre when you're using the Shure SM7B? If I'm using it in reasonably close, about six inches, maybe four inches, I would say for my voice, I generally have to get it up to about 60, somewhere between 60 and 65 dB of gain. Uh, Edwin says, hey Curtis, I'm getting into voiceover and using my closet to record what microphones would you recommend for such a medium to small space, shotguns or others? Well, um, if it's treated, if it's acoustically treated, and I know a lot of people use, for example, a Sennheiser MKH-416 uh, for voiceover. And in fact, let's show that. I want to I want to actually, we're still kind of on the topic here. I'll pull that out. Um, so this is probably a more traditional, I guess you could say, shotgun microphone probably one of the classics here. Um, so the again, the defining feature from my understanding of a shotgun microphone typically is that they employ an interference tube design like this, where they'll have these slits along the edge, or um, you may see them implemented in different ways. There goes the M416. It's going to roll away. 
um, you may see it implemented like this as, as uh, in this case, a series of two slits along the side uh, oriented perpendicular from what you would typically see, like this on the 416. And then there's a, another area there, and they usually include that on both sides. Um, so that's kind of the defining feature, and I don't remember where I was going with this, but that's just something to keep in mind here with shotgun microphones, is that they're, they're employing this, and this does some interesting things, and while it creates this more directional polar pattern, it also introduces these other um, characteristics as well. Okay. Um, so, so, oh, this is where Edwin, okay, I'm on it. <laughs> That's where I was going. Um, so Edwin, I, if, if, if you're working in your closet and you're not getting lots of reflections off the walls, I think a shotgun microphone can be fine. I think the reality is for voiceover, my particular, I mean, ideally you would be able to try multiple microphones and find one that complements your particular voice so that you don't have to do a lot of post-processing. That's the ideal from my perspective. Um, I can't say whether that's going to be a, a 416 or it's going to be a large diaphragm condenser microphone or something else. I think it's funny to me that, you know, the, the two main microphones I hear of for voiceover is typically a large diaphragm condenser or a Sennheiser MKH 416. Those are kind of probably the two most common you hear about amongst professional voiceover artists. Um, if you want something, what I typically try to do in my microphone reviews is that I try to talk about the characteristics of the microphone. So I have a lot of sibilance in my voice, the, the sizzling sound that comes when I say the letter S, such as when I say, she sells seashells by the seashore. Um, so what I typically need for my to complement my voice is something that's not super bright. It doesn't have a lot of sensitivity in that sibilance range from about 4, 4K up to about 9 or 10K. So if you have a good bit of that in your voice, use that as an input on deciding which microphone may be the best fit for you. Um, I would say that the Sennheiser MKH416 may not be a great fit if you do have a real, if you have a sibilance, if you have some sibilance in your voice, a good, a good bit of sibilance in your voice. Sennheiser tends to voice their microphones fairly brightly, uh, in my experience, at least the, the more classic ones certainly were. Um, but a lot of those were designed back in the tape recording, analog tape recording era, where tape was not as sensitive in those higher frequencies. And so they often would compensate for that by making their microphones a little brighter. So they would sound, you know, once they got to tape, it would sound more balanced overall. So um, it's true of the Neumann microphones, too. They tend to be fairly brightly voiced. Um, and that's great if you have a darker voice. By darker, I mean... You have some bass and mid-range, but not a lot of high end, not a lot of sibilance, not a lot of articulation or, or a lot of clarity in the high frequencies, then that's where a bright microphone can sound really good. In fact, Danny has a fairly dark voice, especially for a woman. Um, and actually in those cases, those very bright microphones that don't sound very good on me usually sound great on your voice. So it's, a, it's really a matter of finding a microphone that complements your voice. So I hope I didn't confuse matters there, but there's some <laughs> there's some perspective from from where I sit on vo choosing a voiceover microphone. TechMed, Rainer Richter, thank you very much for the super chat. Very much appreciate that. Pair character bowing down saying thank you. Thank you so much <laughs> for your support. I appreciate that. Okay, Danny's scouring through to see what else is going on in the chat. I'm I'm catching up. It's fun to see that there's so much going on there. There's more. There's more. Stand by. Uh, Boulder Surfer. It can be confusing, but isn't it true that polar pattern can be oriented along the axis of mic body or perpendicular, right? Um, polar pattern can be oriented along the axis of the mic body or perpendicular. That Well, yeah, definitely, definitely true. So a lot of large diaphragm, if I'm understanding correctly... A lot of large diaphragm condenser microphones are side address microphones, so obviously the polar pattern is perpendicular to the body itself of the microphone. Okay, stand by. Uh, here we go. Okay, thanks for the awesome videos. What do you think about the Rode NTG3 versus the Sennheiser MKH416 in a noisy location? Thank you. Um, so I have, uh, I did a, a review, it was actually couched within the review of the Rode NTG5, but I also compared the NTG3 and the, NT, and the MKH416 to that microphone just to get a 
sort of a basis for comparison. What I can tell you is that the um, the MPKH 416 is probably the most um, the one that attenuates the most off-axis sound at 180 degrees. Um, so that's going to get you the most isolation. Um, the NTG3 sounds very similar to me. It sounds a little bit bassier. If you're using the NTG3 up close, it sometimes starts to sound a little wooly to me, like a little too boomy and, and low endy. Um, so that's one thing to watch for. I don't know how to answer that question. I think they can both do a great job. I have no regrets. I, I own both of them, the NTG3 and the MKH416. Um, I generally think of the MKH416 as slightly brighter, and the NTG3 is very bassy and rich. So if you're looking for that studio sound, I think the NTG3 might be a better choice, uh, maybe. And the MKH416 is probably a little bit more balanced and perhaps a little, little brighter. So... In terms of off-axis reject rejection, they're pretty close with the MKH416 have a, just a little edge to it. Can't, uh, can't you use an ambisonic mic like Sennheiser Ambio and in post control the polar pattern? Uh, well, the, the Ambio, for example, actually has four cardioid microphones. And so the idea with ambisonics is that you're capturing a sound sphere and then you can, ch you can turn that, you know, reorient that in post. So it's not so much um, changing the polar pattern as it is changing the spatial information overall. Although I suppose you could just drop some of the other microphones. Uh, maybe maybe there are ways. I don't I don't know enough about post processing ambisonics to be honest. But the, the traditional approach is for gaming, for example, is the idea is if you turn your head, the soundscape reorients itself so it's acts as it's as if you're actually on that location or in that location and you get the same effect as if you turned your head and now the sound waves are coming this way as opposed to the sound waves coming this way towards your head and there's just some very nuanced differences between that but there may be ways to change the polar pattern too i'm not sure mike says best microphone it's often not best but the best for your budget I'm al almost always driven by budget. There's another great point too. So budget is obviously another big factor for choosing. Um, I I, <laughs> I have had people wonder or ask before, this Shep's Seam Super Seamit 2U must be the best microphone in the world, right? And the answer is probably not. Um, if you need to do active noise canceling in a really noisy space and use a boom microphone and you have the $4,000 or whatever it costs to buy that microphone and you can have the extra space in your bag for the little outboard connector you need to, to help do some of that digital processing, it's, it's actually a little box, um, then maybe it could be a good fit. But if you don't have the budget for it, if it's, you know, the self-noise performance on that microphone is not the best in the world. Um, they're just trade-offs. It's always trade-offs, and that budget can certainly be a trade-off factor as well. So thanks for bringing that up, Mike. All right, Darren, any comments on using rock wool insulation for soundproofing walls? Our office is building new construction rooms, wondering difference between acoustic treated sheetrock versus rock wool. Um, yeah, I don't know... I think the idea would be use both. So the rock wool goes in the wall and the and the acoustic treated sheetrock on the outside of the walls would be the ideal. I think typically what you're going to find is the the rock wool is is going to be a little bit better at removing or or absorbing some of the lower frequencies. And that's a lot of what transfers through rooms. In fact, if you want if you have any question about that, go turn on a hi-fi or a, a something with plenty of bass music playing in one room. Turn it up pretty well. Not not dangerously loud, but so that you know it's really filling the room. Go to the next room over and hear which frequencies are coming through. And what you're going to find is it's the low frequencies coming through. It's the bass line and the kick drum, if you're listening to popular music, that's coming through. And a lot of the high frequencies are going to be fairly well attenuated. So that's what the rock wool will do in the walls. It will help manage some of that lower frequency stuff. And if you've got traffic outside, it will help manage a lot of that because there's plenty of, of low frequency stuff going on there as well. So hopefully that helps, Darren. Yeah, there's a long thread of that. Lots of acoustics talk today. 
Also, let me just talk about the distinction between acoustic treatment and sound proofing or sound uh, damping. Uh, uh. Important. Um, yeah, so Mike just brought that up here. Do you mean soundproofing or acoustic treatment? Rock wool is normally used for acoustic treatment. Effective soundproofing is very expensive and easy to get wrong. Um, and Darren's talking specifically about soundproofing here. Not sure of the difference. Our current office environment is pretty loud. We currently have to use dynamic mics in our conference rooms. And? We get a lot of bleed from lobby into our conference rooms. Yeah, not an uncommon situation. Yeah, so it's important to keep, uh, I think a lot of people mistake the distinction between those two. The primary goal of soundproofing is to keep sound from either getting out of the room and bleeding into other rooms or from outside the room bleeding into the room. So that's soundproofing. Acoustic treatment, on the other hand, is largely about optimizing the sound within the space, often for mixing purposes or for recording purposes as well. So um, acoustic treatment is different. So I think, Darren, it sounds like, yeah, you're definitely looking at soundproofing. Uh, you normally need a lot of mass to prevent the bass frequencies from getting through. You'll probably need to go for attenuation rather than elimination. And that's, that's true. So at the studio that I, uh, for my day job, we actually built double walls for the studio. So that's one thing you can do for sound proofing. Um, and also for the floor, they built up the floor with multiple layers and they used a product called green glue <laughs> between the layers, which also provides some additional attenuation. So there are a lot of different things to, to consider there for soundproofing versus acoustic treatment. Uh, does the Deity S Mic 2S have a super cardioid polar pattern? Uh, I don't know. Let's take a look. And also, I was I was um, amused by the one just above that, Danny. Oh. Um, fun fact: in Norway, we call the cardioid microphone the kidney microphone. <laughs> That is a fun fact. Thanks for sharing that. So Deity Microphones, I think it is a super cardioid, going back to the Deity S Mic 2S. So we're going to go under, let me just switch on over to this. We're looking at the Deity Microphone site here. We have the 2S. This is the short shotgun microphone, 15 centimeters, weather resistant. Where is the polar pattern? Super cardioid, they call it. I'd be interested to see it. Uh, do they have any downloads here? I don't know that they do. Can click on that graph? No. Mm, no. Frequency response. No. Yeah, so it's a super cardioid. So if uh, for reference, that is going to look something like this. So we'll have a pickup tail on the back and then be obviously much more sensitive, but narrow, it'll fall off pretty quickly to the sides. So very common one that you see production sound mixers use when they are recording indoors is a super cardioid. And largely because it's a compromise. It has more reach, if you will. And it's technically not reach. Um, when they say that term, let me just talk about that. The term reach, really what they're meaning is that it's, it's a more focused polar pattern on the front. So where, you're, where you aim the microphone, it's going to pick up less of this kind of big cone shape um, space of sound it'll be a little bit more directed towards the, the mouth of the person. So it's not more sensitive in, in terms of distance, but it is more focused in terms of what its, um, you know, what its polar pattern is doing. Just to keep that up, so yeah. Daniel asks or says, what do you think of the newly announced Sennheiser HD 400 Pro headphones? They're reported to be very neutral and excellent tool for mixing. I'm a, I would love to try them. Um, they're Fairly reasonably priced for the HD line of headphones from Sennheiser. I believe they're open back, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I would love, uh, and when I say mixing, in that case, I mean post mixing. For production mixing, you, if they're open back, you wouldn't want to use them, of course, for that. But um, I'm excited to try them. Sennheiser does a nice job with headphones, I can tell you. To add on to Edwin's question, then, would the video, Rode VideoMic NTG be fine for sibilance, voiceovers, etc., in a closet? Uh, I'm trying to remember. Trying, I did do a review on it, so you can go and listen to what I said there. It's been a while since I did it, so I don't remember all the details. I don't use that microphone regularly, to be honest. Um, Rode Video Mic NTG. We'll get that right from the Rode website. Let's just take a look at the frequency response chart. We'll just switch over to this. That's uh, usually under downloads and it's going to be on the data sheet. 
Okay, frequency response. Well, see, <laughs> these are interesting. Um, so here's the polar response, and good job on road. They actually put all the details at different frequencies, up to 16 kilohertz. That's usually really helpful. Um, they're saying this is very flat through the sibilance range. And then there's actually a little dip, and then it pops back up after 10 kilohertz and then falls off after that. In theory, this is highly averaged, I will tell you that. Um, you will see that a lot on the frequency response charts. They'll be very, very averaged. So they're gonna, there are probably little bumps and valleys in here along the way, but they actually removed, they averaged a lot of them out. So these are a little bit tricky from that standpoint. Um, in theory, reading this, it should be a good microphone, even if you do have a good bit of sibilance in your voice. Um, but again, it's one of those situations where you really have to try it before you have a sense for how, how well it mixes with your own voice. Good question. Martin says, do you know by any chance if there are headset solutions to wear a Sankin Cos 11D over ear? You know, I don't, but I wouldn't be surprised if there are. Other people might know in the chat. Um, or just give a call to B&H or actually, um, better yet, give a call to Gotham Sound or True Audio and ask them. They should be able to tell you if there's any solution for that. Ken. The isotope demo showing the off-axis response also is a great example of how phasing and comb filtering will be constant when using a cardioid lavalier on moving talent. Great point. Thank you, Ken. Um, so it'll be doing that. It'll be doing... What was that? Something made a noise over there. Um, I have to think about that. That's, that is... a. Uh, there's a lot in that statement, Ken. Thanks for sharing that. So I think that's going to affect um, um, not so much the person's voice you're talking to, but that's where it's a constant because, you know, obviously, in, well, in theory at least, it will be consistently aimed at the person's voice despite their movement, you know, as they face different directions. Um, however, it will treat the off-axis sound a little bit different depending on what's happening in the ambient sound field around them. Vishal, this has been an awesome live stream. Thank you very much. I've learned a lot from you guys, enough to let go of my rookie thoughts that there is one mic to rule them all. Sadly, no. <laughs> Agreed. Oh, Kevin, it's great to hear from you, Kevin. Are you working on any new courses? If so, any prediction when available? Yes, an update there. Um, last week, just about just a little over a week ago, we did our live Isotope RX introduction course. Um, I'm in post-production now, so I'm editing down the live segments, and then we will have those available, I'm hoping, within a week's time. Um, there's a lot to do there, but that should be available in about a week to two weeks max time. So yes, definitely some more courses coming on that front, uh, Isotope RX. So that's going to cover, it's an introductory course, so it covers Isotope RX elements and most of the standard. Um, yeah, so that's the that's what's happening there. The El Fupo, it's kidney mic here in Austria as well. Furthermore, super kidney and hyper kidney. <laughs> Just using different body organs, I guess. Um, fair enough. Okay, good. Well, everybody, um, it has been a great session. Thank you so much for everyone's input. I really appreciate that. I hope you all have an opportunity to get out there and make some great sound this week. Do that, and we'll talk to you again next week.
幸福。